This presentation is to provide an overview of writing behavioral protocols. Um, specifically as it relates to this class, it will entail writing teaching programs, which essentially is a behavioral protocol. So I may have described this in ABA 511 because I know we went through the process of writing behavioral protocols and um, reviewing them, but I think it's worth going through this one more time just to, to sort of refresh your memory about what components should be in a behavioral protocol or a teaching program. So before getting into those components, I, I do want to mention also one thing is that there are, there are certainly commonalities across behavioral teaching programs or protocols, but the styles and formats may vary. So I, I, want to, I will provide sort of a loose guideline on formatting but I want each of you to be to have some flexibility to use formatting that you think is most useful and um, the best design for your purpose. And in doing so, hopefully we'll all, all learn a little something about different ways to design and organize teaching programs. So the common components of a protocol would include some, some area where you describe the purpose, some area where you describe the materials or what materials are needed to run the protocol, target behaviors with operational definitions. You'd want to indicate who is doing what. I'll kind of expand on this as I go through the, the presentation. And then maybe general procedures. I'll talk about that as well as we move forward. You'd want to make sure you include any discriminative stimuli that are important for running the program. Are there prompts needed? What are the contingencies for responding? So any behavioral protocol, uh, you will have a response. What is the behavior you're targeting? What are you teaching? So the contingency presumably would be placed on the occurrence versus non-occurrence of that response, that response being correct versus incorrect, or that response occurring independently versus prompted. So a lot of options there, and you need to think carefully about these things as you're developing your protocol. And then you'd include any other information that's needed. Let's go through each of these components in a little more detail. The purpose. So the purpose needs to be stated clearly. Often um, your protocol format may certainly include at the top the, the name of the student or client, the date, maybe even the therapist who's running the program and so forth. And then typically in some area, again, perhaps at the top, you would include the purpose uh, and it should be stated clearly. It may mirror an ed individual education plan goal, <clears throat> an IEP, or an IHP, an individual habilitation plan goal if you're working with adults. And uh, that's something we don't cover necessarily in the program. How do you write an IEP or an IHP goal? Um, it, it was covered in 502 in terms of just goal writing in general, and we know that there are certain components of a good goal. But broadly speaking, a goal or a purpose may state something to this effect. The purpose of the picture schedule protocol is to increase independence during vocational activities, or perhaps the purpose of the token economy protocol is to increase and maintain appropriate behavior and decrease disruptive behavior. Then of course you need to specify all the materials needed to run the protocol. And there could be a variety of things needed to run a specific protocol. I also think it's a good idea to include where to find these materials. So again, all, as you're writing these, you wanna use this rule of thumb that can a colleague read my protocol and come in and run this program with the student or the client. So for example, a section may read materials, include a timer, a picture schedule, the data sheet, reinforcers. All materials are kept in the red bin labeled Jack's materials. Please return all materials to the red bin after session. So a lot of additional information there. Um, and you should note that I'm just listing the materials. I don't necessarily have to say the timer will be used for this or the picture schedule looks like this. 
uh, the, <clears throat> the data sheet needs to be this. So, you know, th those things should be organized within the, the general program materials. If you I mean, maybe you keep all these in a binder or something of that nature. So some things are just listed uh, in some areas I use sentences. Okay, now th this additional note of all materials are kept in a red bin. As we go through this exercise or these assignments, you don't necessarily need to keep have something like that in there. I'm not gonna deduct points if it's not in there, but um, it, it's more of something that when you're out there in practice writing these, it is worth indicating where things are and where they should be put away. Then of course you would have the target behaviors with operational definitions, right? So what are the, the, the target behaviors? And it could be one, uh, it might be selecting the letter A when presented with the letters A and B. There may be multiple behaviors, in, but maybe it's a behavioral chain you're teaching and there could be multiple targets. So you'd wanna list those with the definitions. Um, Sometimes these are stated in the goals, right? So the goal may be to increase um, Jack's vocalizations in the form of man's, could be something like that, but they should also be explicitly referenced in their own section. And then you might provide examples if necessary. Throughout the protocol, you should always specify who is doing what. So when we get into the specific procedures, they should read, the therapist delivers, the participant responds correctly, the secondary therapist prompts. Always make sure you're, you're stating who does what as opposed to deliver the prompt. If the child responds correctly, deliver reinforcement. Write it in the sense of the therapist does this. Think of it in terms of um, a, a, an individualized protocol for the client with whom you're working, and maybe it's just you running it, um, but also think of it in terms of something you could pass off to somebody who's working with another client, and actually they should be able to follow the protocol if, if the goal is the same for that client, right? So don't don't just say the ther or don't just say, delivery prompt, wait for a correct response, and deliver reinforcement. Be specific and say the therapist delivers a prompt. Then there are general procedures. Now, <clears throat> when you get into some of these, these teaching programs or protocols, there are things that are common each time you run the protocol or just sort of gen a general arrangement for running the protocol. So for example, the, the, the goal or the target program is always run in the child's classroom. And it's always run at 12 noon and you do 25 trials. That's something that, that you could spell out in a general procedure and you don't have to write in your specific procedures. I hope that makes sense. So how does a session or trial begin? For example, each trial begins by the therapist presenting the picture schedule and delivering the instruction work. So we, we may have gone through this in ABA 511, but consider an example where you're doing discrete trial work and the, um, the task is selecting the letter A, B, or selecting the letter A when presented with A, B. So you would start by saying each trial begins with the therapist presenting picture sketch or the letters A and B and saying touch A. Then you would have other steps that follow, but rather than having to say, then the next trial begins by the third, you could just, you know, reference back to this general procedure. Okay, so uh, we'll, again, a as we start to get into writing these, hopefully um, <clears throat> we'll see some examples of that. Indicate times, duration between steps and prompts. That's gonna be important. So uh, the therapist presents the instruction, touch A, and waits two seconds, right? Or however long you think is important. Who and how are prompts delivered? 
again, we're talking about teaching programs, so many of them, or at least a few, are probably going to include some form of a prompt. Uh, the therapist provides the instruction touch A and waits three seconds for the, the client to respond. If no response occurs within three seconds, the therapist will repeat the prompt, right? Or repeat the, the instruction. Or the therapist will utilize hand over hand guidance to prompt the correct response. So who's, who's prompting? and how are they delivered? <clears throat> Contingencies, again, very important. You're, you're looking to uh, address behavior. In this case, we're teaching behaviors. So we need to specify what are the contingencies for the behavior. And keep in mind, um, you know, again, look, through, look to the literature. In fact, in the, the, the book, there's probably some ex textbook, there's some examples of programs specifically for um, teaching social behaviors, but nevertheless, we need to think about the response. What is the response? Uh, and then what are we actually measuring? <clears throat> and by and large, I would say that we are probably going to end up collecting data or measuring a correct response versus an incorrect response versus no response or a independent response versus a prompted response versus no response, okay? That, that's not always the case, but by and large, for, for these protocols, it probably will be. So you know, I'll stick with my AB example. So there, depending on how we're teaching, our target behaviors will include some mention of touching the letter A if that is the goal. So in a field of let's we'll expand on it in the field of uh, three letters a b and c the client will touch a when provided the instruction touch a so um, there are our responses or target behaviors could be correct responding right simply correct responding which equals the client touching a independently perhaps and then an incorrect response, um, which would be the data being collected, not the target behavior, but data being collected, um, would be you know touching some other letter or not responding within a certain period of time. Um, <clears throat> alternatively, we could have independent responding. The participant select touching A following the instruction, touching A independently rather. And then, of course, there, the variations would be they could touch A following a prompt or some other form like that. So take time to think about these. Look for examples in Java. You will certainly find them and see what the target behaviors are. Again, it might not always specifically be um, stated as touching A. It's probably correct response. The target is a correct response, correctly touching A or independently touching A. So I have some examples here. Contingent on a correct response, a therapist will deliver verbal praise, right? What is the target and what is the consequence? Here it's verbal praise for consequence. Incorrect response will be followed by the therapist initiating an error correction trial. Now we haven't talked about all these procedures. We, we, we probably mentioned a, a handful of procedures in ABA 511. We'll talk about more here. And error correction is, is one of those um, procedures. No responses will be followed by the therapist rep representing the instruction. Okay, so you need to spell all of these out in your procedures. General review on tips and style. Um, all of you should have had um, a sheet you know, on tips and style from, from one of my classes. If you don't, feel free to reach out to me. But consider your audience. Um, Again, when, when we're going through this exercise, I'm looking for you to be highly specific, utilizing your professional terminology and um, engaging in, in quality writing. In, in practice, we, we might sort of, depending who our audience is, for example, if I'm writing a protocol for a parent, I'm probably changing my language. I may not say, uh, I, I probably would say reinforcement, 
but kind of example given reward, right? So I'm going to change my language for the audience. For, for these assignments, write in a professional format. Follow a logical step-by-step -step sequence. Again, it's, it's easier to kind of write these things quickly and um, than it is to think about the logical step-by-step -step sequence. And you want it to be, you know, if you have to do this, in fact, I encourage you to do this. Imagine yourself sitting down with, with your program or protocol and going through the motions, right? So first thing, we sit at the desk. Second thing, you get the child's attention. Third thing, you deliver the instruction. Fourth thing, you do this. But when you get to your contingencies, the, the, the sequence should really, I, there is no particular sequence because however the child responds dictates the sequence. But often what I'll do is um, indicate the contingency for the correct response first. Right now, that might not always occur, but you always start on the positive. So, contingent on a correct response, deliver reinforcement. Contingent on an incorrect response, do this. Contingent on no response, represent the instruction. So, step by step. And then, after that, if there's reinforcement delivered, for example, then you need to indicate <clears throat> that you move to the next trial or continue with the procedure. Some maybe you're referencing return to step one, right? So keep that in mind. Um, proofread these multiple times. Again, sit down and read through them and, and imagine you are running the protocol. Um, I will make comments as I indicated in the course syllabus. <clears throat> I will, um, again, because you do have experience writing protocols, at least in 511, I assume maybe in one of Dr. Perrin's classes, um, we're not going to go through the same editing process as we did in 511. So I expect you to come in with some baseline knowledge of how to write these programs. Um, what I do, what I will do, however, is each week or each time we're turning these in, rather, there's only a couple, three teaching programs. So when these get turned in, I will randomly select s samples, high quality samples. And samples with the errors and I will point out the things that are good and the things that need work uh, they will be anonymous I'll take your name off you don't have to you know uh, there will be nothing to to reveal whose protocol it is the idea here is often students will make errors that are common to everybody's protocol so rather than me sort of <clears throat> you know going through each of your protocol I'll just give this this collective feedback to uh, by way of example. So I'll, I'll videotape as I'm sort of editing or after I, I make comments. Watch your uh, use of the terminology. You know, make sure you get that right because that is important. Um, you know, data or plural. When we collect data, uh, it's plural. We reinforce behavior, not people. All of those things that all of you really should be at the level of, of not making these errors uh, anymore. So you would not say uh, contingent on a correct response, reinforce Johnny, right? <clears throat> it's contingent on a correct response, deliver reinforcement, or deliver reinforcement contingent on a correct response. So once again, there are examples of this in Java. When you read through the description of independent variables, those statements are, are there for, for examples. Uh, use effective and efficient communication. <clears throat> Make sure uh, you know your your sentences are complete. I I, I probably said that um, in 511 to keep your protocols very short, and there is utility in doing that. For this exercise, let's spell things out you know very clearly so they're 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 uh, they can be effective. Uh, I will add, though, you, you should limit the pages. Now, <clears throat> a protocol maybe can, can take up uh, two or three pages. Um, when you get into four and five page protocols for a, for a particular teaching for a goal, it becomes too laborious to read. So again, people have to read these things and do what you're asking them to do. Uh, I find that 
if things are more than two or three pages when you when, when you're working with a client or a student it <clears throat> it becomes too too difficult to read so you want to try to you know you don't want to be overly descriptive you need to be effective in your communication so hopefully that that makes things clear so that that brings us back to proofreading you know write things out as specifically as you can go back to see if you could for lack of better words massage your sentences to make them as effective and efficient as you possibly can that means shortening them taking out things that are not necessary Okay, let's uh, bump over to an example. This is not, uh, I'm not gonna say this is the, the highest quality example, but it is an example, just to give you an idea of sort of where we are going with these things. Let me make sure <clears throat> I have this large on the screen. So this is a protocol. I'm not gonna go through uh, in great detail um, each of the steps, but I want to highlight some of the things. So I have a, the, the, this is from a past student. So there's a purpose. The purpose of this program is to teach a learner to independently identify cat in the presence of a card depicting a cat and a card depicting a dog. The learner will independently identify the target item 90% of the trials. So you have some measurement in there. You have a description of what the, the person should do. There's a setting in which it should be done. There are materials that are needed, and then the target behaviors. <clears throat> Independently touching target item is the target behavior, and it's described within context. So within five seconds of delivery of VSD, which is an instruction, the learner will move their arm, you know, do, do A, B, C, and D. Trials or sessions. So a minimum of 10, a maximum of 20 trials presented per session. So this spells out that this is um, done in a format where you're running a teaching session and that session is divided into teaching trials. Section for measurement, which is great. You wanna indicate what data are being collected. Um, and then you get into your procedures. Now, bullet points are great. You want to utilize those to your um, advantage because they make things very clear and step by step. You can just use bullet points or you can use you know, the numbers one, two, and three. Um, I guess while I'm here, because some people seem to struggle with bullets, um, I'm just going to make a quick, quick sort of tutorial here. So in Microsoft Word, when you're using bullets, the bullets are all up in the, the top menu here. Um, <clears throat> so right there, and I apologize, I have this in edit mode. So I just took all the bullets out. I could add them back. You need to utilize these things. If, if I have bullets, if I indent, that changes the bullet, right? So hopefully you could start to get a feel for that if you already don't know how to utilize bullets. So. Spend some time learning that if you don't know. Okay, let's go through the procedures briefly. I'm not gonna spell these out. So they're saying to do a reinforcer assessment before starting. That's a great thing to add in if you're using reinforcement. It's not always necessary though. Often we will have identified which reinforcers to use in our procedures, but there might be some programs where you're running a reinforcer assessment daily before you start your teaching. Okay, so here, here's a critique of this one. It says, present two cards approximately one foot from the learner, one foot apart from each other. Now that's a great description, but who's presenting the cards? Of course it's a therapist, but let's spell that out. Okay, here again, I would say the therapist will vary the position of the cards presented. <clears throat> deliver the SD, the therapist will deliver the SD, touch cat or touch dog. Okay, again, you don't have to use this formatting, but these are examples. They're indicating which prompting is used. There's prompt fading. These are all procedures that, that some of them you probably know from 511 uh, and other classes. Others will talk about more here. Reinforcement, deliver 15, access, uh, 15 seconds access to reinforcement. 
Then you want to have a section explicitly on data collection, right? What, as you're running these trials, if a correct response occurs, what data are collected? If an incorrect response occurs, what data are collected? They have a section for generalization. I think that's a nice thing to add. And then we want to have data sheets. Here I could see and, and I could reference the protocol that there's a teaching trial. They indicate the order of the items, right? Cat, dog, perhaps. And then is the response independent or prompted? Okay, so hopefully this provides um, some general guidelines for these assignments.